Jai Gurudev, Jai Masters. Keeping perspective is what will determine the quality of your life. You get hung up in the tiny minutia of your mind in the moment, you're going to have a miserable life. If you take a step back constantly and just realize, I'm on a planet, I drop down onto a planet, spinning around the middle of outer space. I will stay for a little while, and then I will leave. That's your perspective. That's an unalienable, unchallengeable truth. There is this planet that's spinning through empty black space. You drop down onto it somehow. You spend a few years here, and you're going to leave. You have to, every morning, every noon, every evening, if you're smart, lots of times in between, remember that. Focus on that. Pull yourself into perspective. Now, if your mind is saying, why would I do that? Because it's the only way to enjoy yourself. You can't get lost up in these meaningless little things that are happening and then think you're going to enjoy your life. You have to step back and see that where your life is is this short amount of time that you spend spinning around the planet. And it is short. I always tell you, the planet's been here for four and a half billion years. How long you been here? You know, nothing. And it's going to be nothing. And so you step back and you look at that. And if you'll do that, at some point you will challenge yourself to ask, why is it so hard? Why am I having so much trouble? Why am I so uptight? Why is there so much anxiety? Why are there fears? What's going on? But you only ask that because you step back into a space where it makes no sense that that is going on. You drop down onto a planet, it's spinning around. Don't worry, it'll keep spinning, right? Every day it rotates on its axis. Every year it revolves around the sun. None of your business. It's been doing it for a while. Don't worry about it. And you just, you're here and things go on and then you leave. By having that perspective, it challenges you to say to yourself, not for me to say to you, for you to say for yourself, why am I having a difficulty? What's so hard about this? And you're going to figure it out. I spent a lot of time studying it within myself. And I came to the same conclusion that all the great ones, everyone else did, <laughs> to Buddha and everyone included, that what is happening is, in the simplest sense, what is happening is you have decided in your mind what you want to happen. It's just that simple. You decided what you want to happen. How do you get to decide what's going to happen? You're a guest. You just dropped in here. It's like walking to somebody's house that you've never been in before and deciding what the wallpaper should be like and what the paint color should be and what kind of range they have and how many children they have and how many bedrooms they have and what color the toilets are. What are you doing? It's not your house. <laughs> You're visiting a house. This is not your planet. You didn't make it. It existed for four and a half billion years before you showed up. It will exist for five billion years longer. That's when they expect the sun to grow enough into a super red, whatever it is, or a swallow up the earth. Don't worry, you won't be around five billion years from now. But can you see that perspective? It has nothing to do with you. I mean nothing. It, it, it created itself and it continues itself. It's happening every single place on this planet. There's something going on that has nothing to do with you. So what in the world are you doing using your brilliant mind to make up what you want to happen when it has nothing to do with you? I'm serious. Why would you do that to yourself? Walk into a house and do that. Why would you ever enjoy your visit? You wouldn't enjoy your visit, would you? This is not going to be that way. Why would it be that way? It's not supposed to be that way. Right? You just made it up. That is what's happening here. And that is the cause of all suffering and the cause of all disturbance. And I'm not teaching you this. Buddha taught you this. The noble truths of Buddha are as deep as they come. Buddha said all of life is suffering. That's the first noble truth. Why, he looked around, everybody's suffering. Rich people, poor people, sick people, healthy people, married people, single people, young people, old people. They all got issues, don't they? <laughs> They're not all just kind of blissed out floating around the planet. Like, none of those people are the way I just said. I drop down onto the planet, I'll spin around, I'll leave. It's fun. No, everybody's got the problem. 
So all of life is suffering. And Buddha looked at this and he said, why? Why? Just like I just said to you, why is there suffering? Why are you suffering? You are suffering. Don't think you're not. You wake up in the morning, you worry. You go to school, you worry. You go to work, you worry. You go here, you got all kinds of things. You worry what people are doing, what they think about you. You care about what people think about you. Now you're really going to suffer. Why? Because you don't know what they think about you. (laughs) You're just making it up. Okay? And it's like there's just all this mess. And he asked why. He didn't come back and say because of inequality of income. He didn't come back and say because of illness. He didn't come back and say because of old age. He didn't come back and say because people die. He didn't come back and say because there's mean people around. He didn't do that. He didn't say it was due to injustice. He did not say any of that. He was deeper than that. He said the second noble truth of Buddha is the cause of suffering is preference. Now you will usually hear it interpreted as desire. The cause of suffering is desire. I choose the word preference. Why? What is a desire but a preference? A desire is a way you want it to be. What is a preference? A way you want it to be. I choose preference, and so did the Third Zen Patriarch and many others, because what you mean by desire is lust, greed. And you say, that's suffering. Of course you suffer if you're greedy. Of course you suffer if you're filled with lust and need and so on, right? That's the Judeo-Western way of interpreting the Second Noble Truth. That is not what Buddha said. Buddha said the cause of suffering is preference. What do you mean? You made up how you want it to be, suffer. It's that simple. If you make up how you want it to be and how you don't want it to be, you're going to suffer. Okay? If I make up how I want you to be, I never met you in my life, but I may, oh, you're my soulmate. I want you to be like this and be like this and treat me like this and be like this and the, the blah, blah, every single thing be like that, right? I'm going to suffer. And so are you, by the way. All right? That, that's what happens. If you make up in your mind how you think it should be, think, emphasis on think, how you want it to be, how you think it should be, how you say it should be, you have just set up a preference. That's how I want it to be. Well, it's not that way. Why? Because you made it up. (laughs) Why isn't she the way I want her to be? Because she's not. She's her. The world is what it is. Why? Because there are forces that created it and made it be that way. And you just drop down into one spot and you start making up all this stuff and then you're upset that it's not that way. And Buddha said that was the cause of suffering. And guess what? He's right. That is the cause of suffering. How do I know that? You know, in science, if we're trying to figure out causes, we introduce and remove variables. You introduce and you remove and you document, evidence-based document, of what change took place because you either introduced or removed a variable. Okay, how does Buddha know he's right? Because all you have to do is decide, I don't want it to rain tomorrow. Go on, just innocent, go on. I don't want it to rain tomorrow. There's a cloud in the sky tonight. How you doing? Suffering. There's thunder in the morning when you wake up. Suffering. There's actually water dropping out of the sky, watering the trees and the plants and all kinds of wonderful things. You're suffering. Are you suffering because it's raining? No. You're suffering because you had a preference. Why would you suffer because it's raining? (laughs) That's the stupidest thing I ever heard of. Why would you suffer because it's hot? Why would you suffer because it's cold? Why would you suffer because she wears her hair different than you wanted it to be? Why would you suffer because of this? Why? Because you made up in your mind, this is what I want. It's called a preference or a desire. I made that up. Lo and behold, if what's going on out there doesn't match what I made up, I suffer. To what degree do you suffer? To the degree that I'm serious about my preference and to the degree of separation between reality and my preference. If you're kind of like what I wanted it to be, I can handle it a little bit. But if you're not anything like what I thought you would be, oh my God, I'm so upset. I'm so disappointed in you. Okay? And so Buddha said the first noble truth, all life is suffering. The second noble truth is the cause of suffering is preference. The minute you set up a preference, you suffer. It's as simple as that. Here, you're going to get old. I don't want to get old. You suffer. Your hair is so beautiful. Someday it'll be gray. I don't want it to get gray. Suddenly you get lines in your I don't want to get lines on my face. Okay, well, you're going to suffer. Why? Because you just set yourself against reality. You just pitch yourself against reality. My favorite is, I don't want to die. Why would I want to die? I don't want to die. I don't want to talk about dying. Suffer. Suffer every time you go to the doctor. Maybe he'll tell me something. I don't know. All right, wake up. The Buddha was right. It's pretty far out, isn't it? 
All of life is suffering, and the cause of all suffering is preference. That's simple. And then the third noble truth, I don't even like to tell you because you don't want to hear it. How to end suffering. Stop it. (laughs) That's basically what it was. (laughs) To end suffering, end desire, end preference. He was serious. That's strict, isn't it? Okay, there's no in-between stuff there. You want to not suffer? Stop making up an alternate universe and getting upset because the real one's not the way you made it up. You'll stop suffering. He just have to stop and say, why do these things cause you to suffer? Why does the weather cause you to suffer? That's ridiculous. Why does the way the car in front of you is driving make you suffer? They're driving 50 miles an hour below the speed limit. I got to get somewhere. You suffer, right? Why does everything make you suffer? It's amazing because you have permitted yourself to do exactly what the Buddha said not to do. You have permitted yourself to make up in your mind an alternate reality, all right? And you did that. And you made it up. And you're serious about it. It's not a game. This is how it should be. This is how it shouldn't be. This is how everything should be. If I go into a restaurant, this is what the music should be like. This is what the waiter or waitresses should be like. This is what the food should be like. What size servings they should be. This is, how, this is whether anybody should be smoking or not smoking. How many people should be in the restaurant. How loud should they be. Who are you? <laughs> You've never been in that restaurant. But if it isn't that way, you don't enjoy your dinner. You don't enjoy your evening. This thing this blot upon your existence of using your mind, your brilliant mind, we'll talk about the mind in a moment, use your brilliant mind to make up an alternate reality and then say, if it's not that way, I'm going to get upset. You're always upset. And you go to war with the world. You have to feel there's this struggle, isn't there? There's this struggle to get people to like you, to do this and to do that and to earn the money that you want to have and have the car that you want to have and have the house that you want to have and never get sick and all these things, all these conditions. And you honestly believe that if you can get them that way, you'll be okay. You will not. Nobody has ever been okay by getting what they want. Nobody has ever been okay by getting what they want and nobody has ever been okay by avoiding what they don't want. Momentarily it is, but then there's the next thing. If you get what you want, you're afraid of losing it. You get jealous. You get possessive. You get insecure. If you avoid what you don't want, you're afraid it might happen next time. There is no win in that game. But that's the game that human beings play. And because they all make up a different reality, they fight with each other. And that's where all suffering and struggle and wars and everything come from. If you didn't do that, we would all live on the earth Imagine all the people, all right? The only way that's happening is if all the people stop this and sit there and say, I'm here, and this is what the weather is. I'm here, and this is what that person's like. I'm here, and I'm interacting with the reality that's unfolding, and I'm high enough and spiritual enough and clear enough to get with the program, to enjoy the unfolding of the life that's being presented to me. It's like a gift. She's a gift. I don't know her. That's wonderful. It's a surprise package. I'm going to get to know her. And I I will not judge her in accordance to what I made up. How can I make up what she's like? I don't know anything she's like. And don't think it's just because her and I haven't met her, right? If you date somebody for three weeks or three months or three years, you don't know them. They have an entire history of 20, 30 years of experiences that molded the way they think and what they want and what they don't want. The fact that two ships happen to cross in the night and for a short period of time, you all look like you're lining up. Oh my gosh, she's my soulmate. She wants exactly what I want. She always laughs at what I laugh at. Don't worry, it won't last. It can't possibly happen. She's had totally different experiences than you and those experiences molded what you decided you wanted and what you didn't want. So let's get that out of the way to start with. So Buddha says, if you stop this game of like and dislike, this game of what I want and what I don't want, your preferences, you're going to stop suffering. There's going to be this thing called clarity. And that's where Buddha went. All right? And not only is there clarity, there's this thing called nirvana. Well, what do you mean by that? I understand I stop suffering. Then you understand you are the most beautiful being that ever walked the face of the earth. You are it, man. You're it. Okay, you're the highest thing that ever walked. Well, why don't I feel that way? Because you're focusing on your desires and preferences and then comparing them against the unfolding of the world and getting upset and focus on your upsetness and complaining all the time. Why are you complaining? Things aren't the way I want them to be. Why else would you complain? 
<laughs> All right? And so that you don't experience your greatness because you're looking out at the part of you that's not great, this psyche that you created, and then you focus on that instead of focusing on who you are, which is a very great being. So that, that's the lot of humanity. And so where did your preferences come from? Where did they come from? God didn't give them to you. Where did your preferences come from? They were learned. There's not one of you that ever decided what you wanted. Don't you dare think that you decided who you like and what you want and what you want your career to be. You did not. First of all, notice how much trouble you have deciding those things. You want to know why? What you're trying to do is match the outside world and see how it matches the model you made up. Well, you don't know. You don't know how things are going to be if you move to New York. You don't know how things will be if you take a job in California. You don't know how things will be if you decide to be a nurse or a doctor or decide to get married, decide not to get married, decide to have another kid. How would you know? You don't have any idea. But you got to figure it out because you got to do something, right? So what you do is you rely on your past experiences. That's what you do, <laughs> all right? If you had a kid and it worked out really nice and you weren't getting along so well, but then you had the kid and you all go, oh my God, love opened back up and you love the kid together. Now you're on a hard spot in the relationship. They're starting to talk about another kid. If you went somewhere on a vacation and it really was really nice and so on, and now was an opportunity to go again, I want to go back there. Well, well, there's 700 billion other places to go. No, I want to go back there. Or if you went there and had a bad time, there were roaches in the hotel. Five-star hotel had a roach. Okay, I ain't going back there. I'm not, oh, no way, man, I spend money to do that. It is your past experiences have programmed you to be for and against certain things. All right? That's where your likes and dislikes come from. Like and dislike is not a natural thing. It's a learned thing. And so there's certain song plays. Your heart starts opening and melting. You think it's a song no, it's because that was the, that's our song. They're playing our song. It's not your song. <laughs> There's no way it's your song, all right? But that song was playing at your high school prom when everything was working out great with your date and so on. And it's just like you hear that song for the next 30 years, that heart just goes, whoo, I love that. So you don't love the song. Some impression got left. If, if you were dancing with him and all that was happening and he dumped you for somebody else that very night on your prom like an idiot, and uh, you don't like that song. That song plays. Your heart's going to close. I hate that song. That's why I say to you, you did not decide what you like. The experiences that you had got programmed. You got programmed by them. All right? And now you're reacting in accordance to that. In psychology, Skinner, B.F. Skinner says, man is the sum of his learned experiences. It's not quite true. I mean, I like that he says that. It is true that your mind, your psyche, that whole self-concept that you built inside is the sum of your learned experiences. But you're the one who notices that. You do notice it when I talk to you about it, don't you? All right? You are the consciousness that notices yesterday I liked him and now I don't. I wonder why. <laughs> because he said something he didn't like yesterday. You know, you wake up every morning with your husband or wife. You feel all this love. You're just so excited and so on. And then something happened the night before. He didn't get along so well. He said something, did something, right? Now you wake up in the morning, go, oh, what am I doing here? I don't even want to be in the bed with this guy. Oh, my God, I can't believe I'm married. What am I going to do now? One day, one little incident. It's just, it's the sum of your learned experiences. It's not something you're doing. You are the awareness that is aware of that. So you wake up and you realize the predicament you're in. There's going to be a world that unfolds in front of you. I teach you that all the time. It sounds so trite and stupid. It's not. Focus on it. There's a world out there, isn't there? And there's a moment that's passing in front of you. Big deal. <laughs> Lots of moments that aren't passing in front of you. The moment passing in front of you is no different than the ones that aren't passing in front of you. It's just a moment. A moment in time, Einstein's time-space continuum. There's this tiny moment, and here it is. It's the one you see. Big deal. The problem is that it comes in and it either is comfortable or not comfortable. I told you the thing Buddha says, the Buddhists say things have their nature. Everything has a nature. A rattlesnake's nature is different than a butterfly's nature. You're not doing that. Those are real. You understand that? A rattlesnake wants to be scary. A butterfly loves being beautiful. And so you feel that vibration. It comes in, but then the snake and the butterfly go away. It should not stay inside of you. That's the problem. The problem is you store these things. You hold on to them. You cling to them. I didn't like seeing the rattlesnake. So now I have this problem inside of me, which is negative. I don't like rattlesnakes. So now you hear a baby's rattle, you get all upset. Now you see a rope, you freak out. Somebody invites you to go hiking, not a chance. 
that one incident that happened when you were six years old has now molded your life. That's absurd. Do you really want to sit there and say you just happened to be in a space and time during whatever was happening, you're walking outside, whatever it was when you were little, and a snake went by? Well, if you'd looked the other way, you wouldn't have seen it. Your whole life is different. Now you love hiking? That's ridiculous. How could you tolerate such a thing? So events unfold. You experience them. Of course, some of them feel good and some of them feel bad. That is their nature. Some people are nice. And when you interact with them, it's you met a nice person. Some people are really, really not nice. I don't know if you know that or not. They're fun. They're just really not nice. They're caustic. All right? And they go there and you interact with them. It's not fun at all. Fine. There's one thing in common between the nice ones and not nice ones. They come and they go. They don't stay right there in front of you. They come, they do their nice thing, they come, they do their mean thing, and they go. You have to do a single thing. It's just it's a motion picture. There's not a still shot here. Everything keeps coming and going. So it comes in, you feel it, you experience it, you learn something from it, and you let it go. Now you don't have all that stuff inside of you. Now there's no reason to make up a world the way you want it to be. You're perfectly happy with the world being the way it is. <laughs> there are nice people, not nice people. That's fun, right? There are butterflies and rattlesnakes. That's fun. You know, it's like, it's like there's lots of things. I'll get to experience the ones I experience, and I'll do my best with them and interact with them. What's wrong with that? That's what be here now means. You're in the present moment. You haven't stored all kinds of garbage about the past. You do not have preferences. I know it's very hard for you to understand. The reason you have preferences now is because of why you build preferences. I stored the fact that this song, Dancing with George, you know, in high school, that was the magic moment of my life. I want to f- wonder where George is now. I'll look him up in Facebook. Oh, please don't. You're trying to go back to a moment that you liked. You hung on to it. You're trying to make sure you don't have a moment that you didn't like. Those are your preferences. That's why you have these preferences. Do you understand that? Because you stored these moments. And so now you're only going to be okay if the world happens to unfold in a way that stimulates a good impression. And you're never okay if it stimulates a bad one. So you now have to go through and manipulate the world to try and make it do what you want it to do. And that's, that's that simple. It's not so complicated, is it? And you waste your life fighting with life, struggling with life, worrying, anxiety. What are worry and anxiety? What do you worry about? I worry that I won't get what I want or that I'll get what I don't want. How about you? <laughs> what else are you going to worry about? So it's not a problem with worrying. It's the fact that you let this happen inside of you. It's like having a bad diet. If you have a bad diet, you can feel sick. Well, what should I do about it? Have a good diet. <laughs> Stop eating the things that are making you sick. Stop doing this absurd thing you're doing with your mind, which is storing these past impressions of good and bad, mostly bad. All right, we'll talk about that later. But mostly the negative things that happen to you and then trying to make sure they don't happen again and try to make something happen, you just locked yourself into the world of your past. Yoga says that stuff's in there because you're holding it in there. There's no reason what happened to you when you were little is still in there. Right? And you start getting strict with yourself. You start realizing, I did this. I stored this stuff, and because I stored all this stuff, I have these preferences. Otherwise, there are no preferences. There's a world unfolding in front of you, and it's like, wow, That's what the Bible means when it says, lest ye be like little children. Wow, look. Look what's happening now. Oh, look. Wow. And everything is new and every moment is new and every situation is whole and real and you're just present with each thing and it's this unbelievable experience. It doesn't mean that some experiences aren't freaky. Yeah, like rattlesnakes are freaky. You ever seen one? I have coiled up 10 feet from me. Shh. That's freaky, all right? They're, they're seriously, they want you to get scared, all right? Fine. So it's an experience you had. Fine. It's over. Let it go. It should not be affecting the rest of your life, period. That's your job. Nobody can do that for you. You're the one who's holding it inside of you. It won't stay in you. You have to suppress it. And see, Freud talked about suppression and repression, but he didn't talk about who's doing it. I like Freud a lot. He really got a lot right. But he didn't take the next step of transcending. Yes, you're right. These things are suppressed and repressed. Who did that? You did. You in there, didn't you? I don't want to experience this. You pushed it away. Yoga focuses on who did this. Psychology focuses on the psyche, this messy mind that got created because you stored all this garbage inside of it. So, of course, if you store the garbage inside of it, it's going to create preferences. It's going to create likes and dislikes. 
that which happened good, I want it to happen again. That which happened bad, I never want it to happen. And all of a sudden, you're an erotic mess. Why? Because you can't handle the unfolding of reality. Because you can only handle what matches this model that you built. And now you lock yourself in your house and you only deal with certain people and you're scared to death. And So spirituality is very, very simple. It's about letting go of this dumb thing you did of holding all these past impressions. Yoga would call them samskaras. Holding all these past impressions inside of you so that you naturally develop these likes and dislikes. That's where your preferences come from. That's why some people, they come and they don't understand. How would I live my life with no preferences? How do I get rid of preferences? They write me, I like my favorite is, isn't not having preference a preference? It's like, it's not about not having preferences. It's deeper than that. It's about letting go of the reason you have preferences. It's not about leaving the stuff inside of you, which naturally will develop. You see why they develop preferences? If you, know, you all get along nice, I like that, I see that, right? If he did something schnooky and you don't like him anymore, you're going to go to a party and you hear he might be there, you leave. It just develops preferences, these impressions, don't they? They develop these ways of behavior, these patterns. It's not about, you have this stuff in there from five years ago, by the way. Now you go to a party and, and whatever it is, if his name is Tom, it's not even just here. Tom, is Tom here? You freak out and leave. Come on, tell me the truth. <laughs> okay, it's not even the same Tom. Doesn't matter. I can't handle myself, so I can't handle that. That's what develops preferences. So spirituality is not about not having preferences as follows. I kept this stuff inside of me. It naturally developed a aversion or attraction, and I'm not going to do it. I just will renounce. It's never about renunciation. It's never about doing or not doing. It's about going to the root. Why do you have this preference? Because I didn't let go of this problem I had years ago. That's what it's about. If you let go of the problem, there won't be preferences. See the difference? It is not about letting the natural flow of events that creates preferences take place and then renounce the preferences. Yoga, the spiritual teachings, the deeper teachings, they don't deal with it that way. They come all the way back inside to the root and sit there and say, why is it that you're having these problems? Why are you so uncomfortable with energy? Why do you have to do drugs? Why do you do drugs? Makes me feel better. That's really nice. Why do you feel bad? That's deep. Because I'm telling you, you will someday, if you will listen to all this and practice, reach a state where the last thing in the world you would ever do is have a drink, socially or otherwise, or do a drug. Why? Because your state is so beautiful, you would never want to mess it up. (laughs) All right? Not because somebody told you not to do it. Not because you think it's wrong or illegal. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with you're willing to come back to the core, to the root. So we've traced the route back. So we went from this whole game of getting what you want and struggling with people and trying to make them be the way you want, right? To understand why do you want things? What is that? Well, I have preferences. Sorry, I have preferences. I have ways I want to be treated. I have ways I want people to talk to me. I have ways how close somebody's allowed to talk to me when they're talking. I I have a preference that if I buy a nice dress or a suit and I I go go to a special party, I don't want anybody else wearing the same one. You're cute as a button. <laughs> you got some preferences, do you? All right? If I eat lunch and have a nice, healthy kale and spinach lunch, I don't want to find out four hours later that I have a piece of spinach stuck inside my tooth the whole day. Ah! You got some preferences? Huh? Come on, come on. All right? It's like it makes life hell. So the question isn't how do I hold myself together even though I have this. The question is why? Why do I care That somebody sometimes says, oh, you got something in your teeth. Thank you. Thank you. Not, oh my God, I wonder how many people saw it. Oh, I feel like an idiot. What are you doing? Why would you want to live like that? That's no fun, is it? Or or, or you stopped at a light and you're looking at your smartphone and the light changes and you don't notice right away. And somebody goes, just very politely, beep. Ooh, you like that, do you? You get all embarrassed. Right? I, I used to watch Mickey. Or <laughs> we already trained well. He, that would happen, and we'd pull up to another light, and this time the car that was behind me is going to pull up right next to him in the light. Oh, he didn't want to do that. He'd stay back a little bit. Just, you, don't want to, you don't have to see the person, do you? I mean, you're pretty embarrassed. You, somebody had to go beep. All right? You start catching on. What's that all about? Why am I like that? Why is it like that in there? Because you've been rejected in the past, you've done stupid things in the past, you got embarrassed in the past, I don't want to hit your stuff and remind you, all right? And you got that stuff in there, 
And now all it takes is the slightest thing in the world to stimulate that. It reminds you of that. Nobody wants to be rejected. You know what a yogi says when you say nobody wants to be rejected? Why? You don't want to answer that, do you? It's sort of like, that, that's a rhetorical question. Nobody wants to be rejected. Of course nobody wants to be rejected. Why? Why? What difference does it make? The answer is, I got all this stuff inside of me. And so I'm like a sensitive person. And if somebody doesn't like me, that reminds me of all these things that happened to me that weren't comfortable and they might not be nice to me if they don't like me. And I don't, oh my God, no, I don't want them not to like me. That's dangerous if somebody doesn't like you. You don't know what they're going to do or say, isn't it? So you got all this junk in there. And so now you have to behave a certain way to match that. What spirituality says is don't worry about what that's happening out there. Don't worry about the fact that you have these preferences. Don't worry about it. It's not about getting rid of them. It's about trying to see why they exist. It's deeper, isn't it? They exist because you have that stuff inside of you. All right, I'm going to tell you a secret. Let's say that one day somebody came up to you and was very mean to you. Say, I don't like you. I don't like you at all. I think you're terrible. I don't really like anybody who likes you. He said the meanest thing in the world to you. And the moment they left, somebody else, that was a girl, said that to you. And a guy, you're a girl, a guy walked up to you after he said, God, that was so terrible and mean what she said. I felt so bad for you. And you felt, oh, he's cute. And it's a nice thing. Next thing you know, a relationship started, and you, you've, it's the greatest thing in the world, all right? That's what happened to you. I'm telling you, the next time somebody walks up to you 15 years later and says some really ugly thing to you, you get excited. Yeah, I wonder what's going to happen next. Because that's the impression that you have. It's just, it's your stuff. You hear me? So you start to work at that level. That's the deep teachings. As you work, you know, the fourth noble truth of Buddha is the Eightfold Path. And if I didn't study it, I've never studied it. But if you study it, I guarantee you, it's about, about getting rid of that stuff. <laughs> all right? That's because that's what all spirituality is about. That's what Christ meant when he said you must die to be reborn. It means you've got this thing you built inside of you that's not you. It's just made up of all these past experiences. It's called your self-concept, your opinions, your views, your preferences, your hopes, your dreams. Call it whatever you want. Do you understand that? You've got a bad case of that, don't you? It's the stuff you built up in your mind, and every bit of it is based on your past experiences. That's where you got it from. And that's got to go. And when that's gone, what's left is spirit. What's left is the highest thing that ever existed or could ever exist. And that's the truth. When that thing falls away, What's left is nirvana. What's left, Christ said, the kingdom is within you. They all said the same thing. But this thing, this thing that draws all your attention to it and you devote your life to it, to getting what you want and avoiding what you don't want, is, is a very destructive thing. It causes tremendous suffering. So that is what's meant by the cause of suffering is preference and to end suffering and preference. The question becomes, how do you do that? Now that you understand. First of all, are you capable of doing it? Yes. Do you have to go off to the mountains? Nope. In fact, don't. Don't go to Kathmandu or whatever it's called. Right? Don't go wandering around trying to find all these people. It's, it's, nope. That's not what it's about. That's, that's almost like the worst thing you can do. Once you catch on. Well, why? Why? Because you built these things in the life you are now living in. The life you are living in is the reflection of the stuff you have stored. If I walk into your house, you have pictures of Beethoven and Mozart, and you got Playgirls of the Month hanging up there, and you got this or that, and you soccer stars, and you got, you understand that? If the outside world you surround yourself with is the projection of what you're trying to build to make yourself feel comfortable. It is a projection of what you like and what you don't like, isn't it? That's what, you know, that's what you're trying to do. The car you drive, the clothes you wear, the way your hair is, whether you wear contacts or glasses, every single thing is the reflection of what's left inside of you, of the attempt to get comfortable by having the outside match the inside. That's what your projection is, what you're doing. That's the job you like, that's the career you think, that's every single thing is that. So basically, you get to the point where you understand that because you built this world around you like that, it is the perfect world to help you get rid of your stuff. Why? Because if it isn't exactly the way you want, if you walk into that house and a poster is taken down, you freak out. 
If you walk into a house and your husband or wife doesn't treat you exactly the way you expect them to, you freak out. If somebody forgets an anniversary, you freak out. If there's a scratch on the car, you freak out. In other words, you cement around yourself the world that matches your inner state. If it doesn't match that, it challenges this game you're playing. So every single time something happens that freaks you out, it's grace. It is an opportunity to stop playing this game. This game of I can only be okay if everything outside of me matches the garbage that's inside of me. right? And by the way, go on. I'll go in and look at your house. Here you have all the different things here, colors, this, that. Everything's a certain way. Your car, everything like that. And all of a sudden you went to work and somebody new came in and you kind of was cute. And you kind of fell in love a little bit. And they were totally different than you. And they were a motorcycle driver and anything like that. I guarantee you I come back to your house two months later some motorcycle on that wall. I used to hate motorcycles. It changes in accordance to what you clung to inside of yourself. And all of a sudden, the world has to be the way you need it to be. And all of a sudden, you wake up and you say, that's not a game I want to play. That's a, that's a dead-end game to try and make this world that has nothing to do with me, remember? <laughs> it was like kind of dropped in to see what was going on, and now it has to be a certain way for you to be okay. No wonder you're not okay, because it's not going to be that way, is it? And so you start playing the game, It's called the master game, the game of liberation, of sitting there saying, in exactly the environment I'm in, what if I stop manipulating it? What if I stop manipulating it to try and make it be the way I want? Whoa, that's some deep stuff. Not what if I leave it? Not what if I, you know, go to my significant other and say, look, if you'll be like this, I'll be like this. And we like a detente we got going on here, Right. What if you just literally started to say, I don't want to play this game anymore. This is a dead-end game. I've never, have you ever been okay? Totally okay for any prolonged period of time? Of course not. Your entire life, you've tried to get it the way you want, haven't you? When have you ever been totally okay? Not a single thing to worry about. Everything's perfect, and it stayed that way more than five minutes. It's like, give me a break. Wake up. And so you just sit there and say, if I have but one life to live, I ain't living it that way. I want to explore. I want to explore alternate ways to live my life. Ways that maybe work, all right? And so you sit there and say, as long as I need the moments in front of me to match the garbage I have inside of me, I'm in trouble, all right? Because the moment keeps changing, and I got to keep manipulating it and worrying about it, don't I, all right? I got to make everything be the way I want. What if I don't do that anymore? What if I don't do what? What if it can stay there? I'm not changing anything. What if I stop playing the game of manipulating to try and make it match what I got going on inside. Well, I hope that scares the hell out of you because that's what it should do. Because what it's going to mean is OMG. I mean, even the slightest thing can set you off, can't it? That's the tiniest little thing. You can't handle anything. <laughs> it's just like if you get a little spot on your pants when you're at lunch, you don't want to go back to work. You, what do you cover? What do you do? Or you get a little zit on your face. I mean, tiny little red spot on your face. I don't want to go out. What do I put on it? What? We can't handle anything. And now I'm sitting here saying, okay, <laughs> okay, let's learn to. That's what it boils down to, and that's spirituality. Not changing the outside world. Being willing, and what it means to learn to is you're going to have to let go of that stuff you stored. You hear me? So if your parents got divorced and it was so traumatic to you that you never got married, Why? Because I'm not doing that. It sounds real good. I'm not doing that to my kids. I'll never do that to my kids. Now you're not getting married or having kids. Yeah, well, how do I know? Maybe we won't get along. And uh, No, no. I don't want to go that way. Wow, it sounds so good. Right? It's just your junk that you're unable to handle a perfectly normal situation. Your parents got divorced 20 years ago. It should not be affecting the rest of your life, should it? All right? So here's a perfect example. So you got that stuff. And every time you hear the word divorce, your heart gets a little weird, doesn't it? Every time you get too close to somebody and it looks like they might propose to you, you break it off. People behave like that. Do you understand that? You're literally living your life because you're devoted to your garbage. Is the lowest part of your being. What is? The part you couldn't handle. You couldn't handle it and now it's running your life. Well, if you want to be spiritual, it doesn't mean getting married or not getting married. It means the next time you hear the word divorce, it's not a movie, it's a thing, and you start getting weird, relax. Relax. Don't do anything about it. Just relax. You weren't able to handle the energy of the divorce when it took place 20 years ago. 
You're still not able to handle it. That's why you resist it. Little by little, just relax when it comes up. Give it room, and it will pass. A little bit of it will pass. If you don't push it back down, if you don't defend yourself, you're either pushing it down or you're expressing it. Let me tell you, I know about divorce. I don't like that movie. I didn't like that movie. Let me tell you about it. I went through a divorce like that. Oh, there we go. You couldn't handle the energy. Now you got to go dump it on somebody. Hear me? Or you got to push it back down. How about we just let it go? What if we just relax and let it release? Whoa, it's going to hurt, man. Stored with pain is coming back with pain. Just relax. Relax. Release. R&R. Relax and release. And what will happen? I guarantee it will come up. Because <laughs> the only reason it's staying down there is you won't let it come up. It is not natural that it stay down there. You understand that? It's not natural. It takes your energy to keep pushing it back down. Suppression and repression are not natural. They are things you are doing because you can't handle the energy. Well, do you want to live like that? You have to say no. No, I don't want to live a, a lost life like that that's devoted to the lowest part of my being. I want to explore my high. I want to explore the highest roots that could possibly happen, the branches up, all right? And so to do that, you have to stop clinging and holding on to this garbage. So it starts to come up. Maybe you saw a movie, and so let it go. doesn't mean you have to get married right away, and, right? Just let go with what's happening. You do not have to do anything if you want to let this go. If you're willing to sit there and say, I don't want this stuff in here, and it's not going to be in here, And I'm not going to go find it. It's going to find me because it always has. (laughs) It has a way of coming up, doesn't it? It's like a target. And every time it gets hit, I'm going to say, hooray, I'm letting this thing go. All right? And it comes up. And I don't care what it takes. You breathe. You relax. Now you start getting mantra because you can't let it go. Do a mantra because you can't even be present when it comes up. Meditate so you learn to be present. Right? That's what all those techniques are about. But when it's said and done, you meditate all you want. Do all the mantra you want. If you don't let that stuff go, you're not going anywhere. You go meditate for three hours, get up, and then try to manipulate everything to match what you want. You didn't, you didn't do anything. You offset the whole thing. Relax and release. That stuff will come up by itself. It is by definition that your natural life is the reflection of your stuff. Why? You made it that way. <laughs> you clung to the parts you wanted and you pushed away the parts you didn't. You shoved the things inside. The whole thing is just this mess that you made because of your stuff. Therefore, by definition, it's going to hit your stuff because you made your life be that. It's right there. All that has to happen is one thing is not the way you want. It's not positioned the way it is or anything. It's just not natural. All I can say is it's not natural. You created an artificial environment and it's not going to stay that way. So if you let go, And you're going to see it's all going to change. And it's going to hit your stuff. And so you keep letting go. You keep letting go. And what's interesting is it may be the outside doesn't change. What I go to, right? Maybe maybe you thought you were manipulating it, but really life was bigger, (laughs) right? You you ended up with the right person married, even though you did it for the wrong reason. You know, life's pretty interesting. But the net result is inside, you let go. You keep letting go. You keep letting go. No matter how much it hurts, no matter how scared you are, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how impossible it seems, but you only let go of what comes up by itself. You don't have to go down there and search for it and, oh, I got to get this out of here. No, you do not. You just got to be willing to breathe and let go on a daily, moment-to-moment basis. Somebody comes up to you and says, that's Daniel George, I didn't like you. And you'll see all this not like stuff come back from high school and all fear of rejection, right? Good, wonderful, good. Inside, let go, all right? Now, at first, you can't do this. So I always teach you start with little things. You start with the fact that you can't handle the weather. You know, you can't. Do you understand that? You complain about it all the time. Why is the rain on the weekend? It could have rained during the week. <laughs> Why is the rain on my birthday? God doesn't like me. What are you doing? Right? The weather has nothing to do with you. So start with the weather. I swear, you will grow so much if you just start with the weather. You know, you don't believe me. I'm telling you. Just catch yourself every time you're in there complaining about the weather. Thinking of what you want it to be and what you don't want it to be. Nobody cares what you want the weather to be. It does not going to affect the weather. And the more you get into the way you want it to be, the more you suffer. <laughs> the more you don't like life. How about we stop that one? Just that one will change your life. So the next time you find yourself complaining about the way, rain or, or not rain or the heat or the not heat or the wind or the not wind or the humidity or the not heat. Come on, you complain about a lot of things, don't you? How about we catch that and realize it's not innocent and just relax, relax and enjoy the reality 
of what's happening. If it's raining, be grateful that you live on a planet where water falls out of the sky. On Venus, it's hydrochloric acid that falls out of the sky, right? I think I'll take the water. How about you? And you learn, you learn, I don't care if you use positive thinking, if you use mantra, get something going inside your head that you can just hang out with instead of the complaints about the weather. Oh, it's so hot. God, God, God. That's what mantra's for. It gives you an alternate place to put your awareness instead of listening to the leftover garbage that you built inside yourself. And if you do, it will leave. Yukteswar, Yogananda's guru, told him, an ignored guest quickly leaves. An ignored guest quickly leaves. If you don't hang out with that weather complaint, it'll stop complaining. It's that you're putting your heart into it. You're feeding it. Just let go. If you're married, somebody does something, irritates you a little bit, let it go. Why? The alternative is absurd. Like the classic is he left the toilet seat up. He leaves the top off the toothpaste. You have to really a bear living with somebody else, isn't it? All right. How about we just enjoy the top thing? Look, how about next time the top's off the toothpaste? Wow, that's convenient. I don't have to take it off. You can do whatever you want. But the difference is, if you can't handle that the top got left off the toothpaste, you can end up liking your husband or your wife. You'll build this stuff inside of you, and I guarantee you'll tell a friend, I can't believe living with him. It's like a slob. He leaves the top of the toothpaste. I don't know. You're laying the groundwork to ruining the relationship because the top was left off the toothpaste. Give me a break. So little by little, you look at the absurdity of what you're doing with your mind, and you let go. You let go. Just keep letting go. Keep letting go. And at some point, you won't have all these problems. And then what will happen is because you let go of enough you start feeling this beautiful energy. It always is there. You listen to me. It's always there, and it's always flowing up. You know how high you get when it raises your energy and the sunset's beautiful and love goes up? It's always going up, and your heart goes up, and your face goes up and smiles. Constant flow of upward shakti, energy. The master said there's a river of joy that flows inside of you. Find it, go there, get in, and drown. All of a sudden, your life becomes about ecstasy, becomes about seeking these beautiful experiences instead of about trying to make somebody be the way you want or make the job be the way you want. It's like these tiny little to make the weather go, let's move. It's like you stop doing that. And, and at some point, when you let go of the negative, it starts becoming neutral, then it starts becoming positive because that's what's inside of there. So that is the spiritual journey. That is the entire spiritual path. That's what's meant by letting go of preferences. The third Zen patriarch, that beautiful thing I say to you sometimes, it's a treatise on, on faith mind. And I still read it once a year. I read that writing. It starts off with, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. When love and hate are both absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. Make the slightest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. To set aside what you like from what you dislike is the disease of the mind. And it goes on like that. <laughs> All right, it's the deepest teaching that could ever be taught. But the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. That's a true statement. Do you see it now? If you will work at the level I told you, which is every time something hits your stuff, let go. If you could let go every time it gets stimulated, you're going up. Do you understand that? And that's just something you do inside yourself. So I'd love for you to work with that. You make the world a better place. Like around you becomes a special place because you're not pushing that stuff back. You're letting it go. Mm -hmm. Work on these things. Jagrative.